I love reading in Acts. It's so insightful and really helps us with origins. Where did the church uh, get started at? How did it come to uh, function? And uh, there are things that aren't Acts that don't belong to the church. And I think Acts helps with that as well with regard to function. So Acts chapter 19 tonight. And we will go down to verse 21. We'll look kind of at a story. And then we will draw some practical application from lives of people that God used in good ways and bad ways. Sometimes it's good not just to look at the good, but to look at the evil, and uh, or even look at people who turn aside and go away from the truth because it gives us a good perspective uh, on the warnings about the danger of blasphemy and false doctrine. Acts chapter 19 and verse 21. This is Luke giving his account. He's talking about what happened. If you'll bear with me, and uh oh, if you'll bear with me and uh, really kind of get into the story, allow your imagination to see the individuals and the travels and the conversations, you'll find this a fascinating uh, bit of Bible. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the Spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season, and the same time there arose no small stir about that way. Now when the Bible talks about that way, it is speaking of the believers, the individuals that were, uh, the, that were part of Paul's team preaching the gospel. And they're a motley crew, we'll see them uh, described here. Here's what the problem was, verse 24, For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation, and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, you see in here that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. So that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship, worshipeth. And when they had heard these sayings, they were full of wrath, and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! And the whole city was filled with confusion, and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing, and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. And that sounds like a mob, doesn't it? What are you doing? I don't know. But everybody's here, so that's what we're doing. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander beckoned with the hand and would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, You men of Ephesus... What man is there that knoweth not how that the city of Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For if ye have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess, wherefore if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open, there are deputies, let them implead one another. But if ye inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly, for we're in danger to be called into question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. All right. Now, let's pray, and we'll ask God to help us as we just look at some angles of this story and make application from them. Father, please help us tonight as we look at a passage of Scripture which oftentimes in Acts is obscured by doctrinal teaching or uh, by teaching that really uh, is, is less historical and more 
specific to the power of the Holy Spirit and so forth. But God help us to see some practical things about how believers ought to behave themselves in this portion of the scripture we pray in Jesus name amen as we mentioned in the announcements about making sure that you that you register to vote on Tuesday one of the things that I think about is the privilege of believers of knowing with confidence that you are part of a government or of a kingdom which is not of this world how many are thankful that God's kingdom is not of this world I surely am Man, I'll tell you, sometimes I just think I'm ready to get out of here and be part of a perfect place. You know, we hold on to this life so much. And uh, when reality sets in and you begin to see uh, how real eternity is, oftentimes one of the things that I ponder, one of the thoughts that crosses my mind, is why hold on here? Why hold to this place when the city that we seek is one whose builder and, builder and maker is God? I hold on to this city when there's a better city. And so uh, uh, music comes to my mind that I will not sing for you this evening as I think those thoughts. But uh, I see oftentimes in Acts the correlation between being a believer and being a citizen. And being a good citizen and appropriate deportment, obedience to the law. There's a lot of lawlessness that's recorded in Acts on the behalf or on the part of people who oppose the gospel, isn't there? There's a lot of lawlessness. Many times you see the apostles arrested and beaten for preaching the gospel. And uh, no law to support it. Remember when Paul was at Philippi and he was beaten and we know that the Philippian jailer ended up getting saved. And In the end, the justices said, okay, you guys, or they said, you guys can go. And they said, no. And they said, they've beaten us openly, being Roman citizens. Let them come and fetch us out. In other words, they behaved unlawfully. Let them release us lawfully. You arrest us unlawfully. Unarrest us lawfully. It seems a little bit, on Paul's part, a little bit uh, brassy, doesn't it? Just like he's got a little bit of uh, gall that maybe doesn't need to have some Christians. I uh, think that they ought to knuckle under uh, when uh, the authorities are not behaving properly. And I don't, I don't think so at all. I don't think you ought to ever disrespect authority. Uh, you should never uh, disobey authority. But to demand of authority that they, be, that they conduct themselves in the way in which they're supposed to is something that every citizen has the right to. And I think there's great examples for that in Acts many examples of demanding that the authority deport themselves appropriately and at the same time saying yes sir I'm going to jail <laughs> you know and off they go now in this situation <clears throat> folks have heard that Paul's in Asia and in Macedonia they're very very upset at this time he and Timothy I'm sorry Timothy is in Erastus are in Macedonia <coughs> um, and but Paul is here, and he has said, uh, he had, or I'm sorry, he hasn't done anything. There's, there, there, there comes up a, a stirring because the disciples are in town. And this man, Demetrius, who's a silversmith, has made a living of selling fake gods. And he has a point. He said, you know, this guy Paul's bad for business. It's interesting, and it's a problem. We ought to look out for it. It's a problem when a city makes decisions on the basis of finances, what's best for us financially. That's where the casinos come to town. Man, a, casi a town that becomes a casino town always goes into ruin, 100% of the time. That's when uh, uh, the bars and the pubs and the breweries and those places come to town because the argument is, well, they pay a lot of taxes, and it'll be good for the taxes. Forget about them turning drunk, turning people into drunkards, and forget about the taxing of the court system and the justice system, erect, arresting people who are out of control because of being under influence of those things. Uh, but it is a real problem when a city thinks along those lines. And Demetrius, the silversmith, starts an uproar over idols. Now we see the idols. We know that Paul is guilty as charged. 
with regard to saying that idols aren't real gods. That's the accusation Demetrius makes. Demetrius said, you know, Paul said that uh, our idols aren't anything. <laughs> In verse 26, Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. <laughs> Demetrius' argument is, Paul said that any god that you can make with your hands isn't really a god. <laughs> what? <It's not. laughs> if you made it, it's not God. Right? At best, it's inferior to you. And Demetrius, said, he's, he's hurting the trade, telling people this. This is bad for business. Now notice, facts don't matter to Demetrius. The question, can something you made answer a prayer? No. Can it's just something you made? It's a piece of silver that you fashion into a, an image that looks like something that isn't silver. It's just a fake something that isn't God. And idolatry was a problem in Ephesus, wasn't it? So Demetrius is making money off of a lie, and he has a problem with the truth. And <laughs> The guys that were part of the trade, <coughs> they kind of they kind of went along with it. Now I want to look at a couple of things that happened here. There's three notable individuals. Actually, Acts 19 and 20 is a very interesting character study of obscure characters. Uh, that's kind of what brought me here, is I was just doing a study of obscure characters. And this is an interesting study of obscure characters. Uh, the first obscure characters are in um, verse, verse 29, but let's read verse 28. After Demetrius made his speech about how that the idol business is going to go out of business and nobody's going to go look at Diana, the fake goddess, any longer, when they had heard these sayings, verse 28, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! And the Bible says the whole city was filled with confusion and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. Now this is really comical to me. Now not if you're, if you're Gaius and Aristarchus. By the way, those are interesting guys. They're just two guys that were always there with Paul. You don't really know anything more about them except that they were there. Uh, Aristarchus was with Paul when he was shipwrecked. Uh, Gaius is with Paul constantly. And Aristarchus is mentioned several times, but just not really mentioned with anything that he did, except for in this instance we see Aristarchus, and his grand part is to be caught and dragged into the theater. So they didn't catch Paul, but they knew that Gaius and Aristarchus were part of Paul's traveling team, and so they caught them, and they said, we got these guys! They dragged them in the theater, and everybody gets in the theater, and it's this massive place, and everybody's screaming and yelling, and nobody knows what they're there for or what's going on. That's what the Scripture indicates. They're all just crying out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! Great is Diana of the Ephesians! After Demetrius has just given his wonderful short speech about how that idols made with hands are real, and uh, Diana's the same as the idols made with hands, and we're going to lose money if people stop looking at Diana, stop traveling to see Diana. And that's basically the... the the scenario. The Bible says as well that uh, the crowd that was there, the greater part of them, the, the Bible says the assembly was confused and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. This is much like, uh, Charlie, you did this at Taco Bell last week, didn't you? Where you uh, was it Taco Bell? It was some place where you're staring up into a tree. Was that Thursday night? What night? day were we? No, it was at Speedway. We got out of the bus at Speedway last Sunday. Was there something in the tree? I refused to look. I want to say there was, yeah. You want to say there was? So we got out of the bus on the way to Miami parrots, Beach. What was? Oh, parrots. I didn't look. I did hear parrots. But I said, I'm not going to look up there just because Charlie's looking up there. Because we got out of the bus at Speedway, and Charlie's like this, looking in the, in the tree. And then Angela went by, and she's looking in the tree. I said, I'm not doing that. 
<laughs> I'm not just going to look up because somebody's looking up. Like, hey guys, what you looking at? You know? yeah. Because that's what happened here in this crowd. In other words, everybody's going, greatest Diana of the Ephesians! Greatest Diana of the Ephesians! Greatest Diana of the Ephesians! And somebody's walking along like, hey, what's going on? Hey, greatest Diana of the Ephesians! Pretty soon they're all yelling. It's fun to get in a crowd and yell something, you know, Man. chanting. I would like to picket or protest something uh, sometime uh, with no meaning to it at all and just see how many people would join us or report on it. We should just protest something and chant something clever that means nothing and see how many people would join in. You know, it's just fun to be part of a mob, you know, that mob mentality. And Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the Bible says that most of the people there had no idea what was going on. They caught Gaius and Ar and uh, what's the guy's name I always forget? Aristarchus. What? Aristarchus. They caught Gaius and Aristarchus. And <coughs> those guys are in there and they're caught. And they probably slipped loose by this time. They probably are just in there going, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the trying to work their way to the door. And there's a whole mob there yelling this, and they don't even know the reason they're there. They missed probably the original speech. They don't even know what's going on, but they're all part of it. And there's this big hubbub and uproar. And then this guy, Alexander, is popped out of the crowd, pushed to the front. I'm not 100% sure about this, but it looks as though this is Alexander the coppersmith. Probably. Makes sense that he would be Alexander the coppersmith if he's hanging around the silversmith. Part of the guild uh, of idol makers. And probably Alexander the coppersmith uh, made idols himself. But he was Jewish. <laughs> um, you say, Pastor, a Jew wouldn't make idols. You ever see one of the little stores where they make Judaica? What, what is all that? What are all the little symbols and all the things that they make? It's just a way to make idols for money. And so Alexander the coppersmith certainly would have done that. It seems as though Alexander the coppersmith had been converted. And so the Bible doesn't say it's this Alexander, but I think it was. Uh, it seems to be. And the Bible says they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. So now there's in the multitude, you know, there's all these idol worshiping, uh, idol worshiping uh, Ephesians. And now we see in the crowd are all the Jews shouting, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! I mean, they're just probably, they don't know what they're there for, but there's a whole crowd and they're like, Alexander, you need to say something. You need to make a speech. You know, speak, speech, 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 speech. So they push Alexander out of the crowd, and everybody's in a hubbub and an uproar anyway. And, and so <laughs> the Bible says, when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So here's a guy, he's probably probably going to make a speech, most likely. Now folks say, well, he's part of the missionary team of the apostles. No, he was part of the Jewish crowd that was there. He might have been a believer. <coughs> he probably was. And so they're saying, you know, Alexander, you need to address the crowd. You need to calm people down. You need to tell people something. And when he came out and they saw he was Jewish, they just started protesting that. They, cause, why? Well, because they were ready to protest anything. It really didn't matter what they... So for two hours, can you imagine two hours in a crowd just yelling, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Then the town clerk comes out. And uh, he gets him. Come on, guys. Come on. He's probably doing this for two hours. Come on, guys. Come on, come on. Come on, come on, stop, stop. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Some people over here would stop, and while they're stopping, people over here would, Greatest Diana of the Ephesians! He'd come over here, and these people were here, Greatest Diana of the Ephesians! It's just getting nuts. It's just crazy in there. And, <laughs> and now, Alexander the coppersmith's there, and they did it for two hours, and the clerk gets everybody calmed down. He makes this speech, and the speech to this effect is, We're an orderly group of people. We obey the law here. And so, if Demetrius has, if he has been wronged, then let him go to court. And that was the end of the story. Why is that in the Bible? If I'd been there, I'd tell the story, right? I like to tell stories about things that I see and do. I'm always somewhere where something funny happens or people are doing something ridiculous. I'm always telling a story about something. And if I'd been there, I'd tell the story. But listen, it wouldn't have made Acts. It wouldn't have made Acts for me. Would it for you? I mean, is this a significant happening in the early church? 
Charlie's looking like he knows the answer. Well, <laughs> sounds like the anti-Trump, never Trump. The never Trump crowd? Yeah. Or the anti-Trump. I'm not preaching about Donald Trump tonight. <laughs> We're preaching. Thank you, Charlie. No, he's getting me back for derailing the Sunday school. <laughs> All right. No. No, that's not. I don't think that's it. Well, the clerk said, if you inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be termed in a, determined in a lawful assembly. Well, it seems that Alexander must have been a believer or known as a believer or something like that. And here's something I want to say about him from this context. I admire that Alexander was willing to address the mob. Don't you? When Paul left town, he left with Gaius and Archippus or Aristarchus. I always mix that, mess that guy's name up. I always will. He left town with Gaius and Aristarchus, and so things worked out for them. And Alexander got berated for being a Jew for two hours and uh, withstood that. It seems that Alexander became a believer of sorts. Go to 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, will you please? 1 Timothy chapter 1. I want to just read about the kind of people that God saves. And then... Uh, Read a warning there too. 1 Timothy chapter 1. In uh, verse 11 of 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul's talking about <clears throat> people that have turned aside. and He identifies himself as one who wasn't worthy to be put in the gospel ministry. In verse 11, Paul said, According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, and I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, verse 12, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now this is a great testimony on behalf of Paul, is it not? Here Paul testifies that wicked people deserve hell. Sinners deserve hell, and he classifies himself as the chief of sinners. He says, I, when it comes to wickedness, I am the chief of sinners. We usually think of Paul in context of the Apostle Paul, which is he, what he's alluding to here. And normally when we think of Paul, we think of uh, perhaps the greatest theologian to ever live. That would be indisputable, I think, for a person to argue that an individual could explain Bible doctrine and take the Old Testament Scriptures and just show the sense of the consistency of salvation always being by faith, by grace, and uh, to explain the doctrines of the faith as well as Paul. There just wasn't anyone that wrote the volume of material and expounded the Scriptures the way the Apostle Paul did. So when we hear him describe himself in the category of adulterers and blasphemers and really <coughs> label himself, I was a blasphemer. We think, Paul, thanks for the humility. Thanks for thinking of yourself that way. But Paul, you're a good guy. But if we actually engage our brains for a minute, we will recognize that Paul actually was a terrible man. He murdered Christians. He was a murderer. Took innocent lives. And persecuted Jesus Christ himself. Who was it that met Paul on the road? The Lord. And what did Jesus say? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? A persecutor of Jesus himself is indeed a blasphemer. And the very definition of it, isn't it? A person who would have the gall and the audacity to literally rail, breathe out threatenings and slaughter against the Lord and the disciples of the Lord is a blasphemer. And Paul was. You could ask yourself the question, well, didn't Paul just respond to his teaching? Wasn't he just born and bred to be a Pharisee? 
And wasn't that why, you know, because of his devotion to the law and his zeal for the law, wasn't that why he blasphemed Jesus Christ? Listen to me. The miracles that Jesus did proved to everyone that he was God. And anyone with an open mind had no room for doubt to question either the deity of Jesus nor his resurrection. Those were facts. And an open-minded individual who wanted to really know God and have a relationship with Him would have come to the conclusion that Jesus was God and that He was the resurrected Messiah. Period. You're not open-minded if you won't look at the facts about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Had Paul been open-minded, he would have been a believer. Instead, Paul, by choice, was an unbeliever and deliberately a blasphemer. And then he met the Lord. He said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Saul, you're fighting a losing battle. And Saul humbled himself and he became a believer. He described by faith in Jesus Christ. Now the Calvinists will tell you that Jesus forced a conversion from Saul, you know, knocked him down, blinded him, and then he had no choice but to become a believer or something like that uh, on the road to Damascus. But Saul describes his conversion later being Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit, for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first... Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter. What's that next word? What is it? Believe. believe on him to life everlasting. Paul said, I believed in Jesus, and I'm a pattern to those that believe in Jesus. So did Paul get a forced conversion? No, Paul became a believer. God made him deal with facts, but he could have rejected Jesus anyhow, and he believed. So Paul believed. Now, that's not the point this evening. I want to get down to verse 18. After he's described his own blasphemy, he describes another blasphemer, or a couple, but one specifically we'll look at this evening. This charge, I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went on before on thee, that thou by them <coughs> mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some have put away concerning, <coughs> concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, Alexander, I think that this is <coughs> probably on the basis of it being Asia, where Timothy is, and on the basis of it being Alexander uh, in the same place, <coughs> I believe that this is the Alexander that we find being pushed to the forefront of the crowd and expected to speak uh, reason about the men saying that there are no idols. And so from this we see this same Alexander, if the surmising is correct, I believe it is, there's enough scripture there. If it's not, you can just ignore it and uh, get some other tidbits uh, about Saul's conversion if you like. But there's enough here for us to actually see that Alexander at one time was a spokesman for the faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul wanted to go into the theater and uh, speak on behalf of Gaius and the other fellow that I keep forgetting his name. Ar not Archippus, but uh, Archippus. Aristarchus. Yeah, I'll always call him Archippus. I'm sorry about that. It's just there's something switched in my mind. It's like I always call... Glenn's Greg's and Greg's Glenn's and Jeff's get mixed up as both of those in my mind. I don't know why, but that just happens. So, those are just names. And I, don't, I know Glenn doesn't sound like Greg and Greg doesn't sound like Glenn. And Eric Starkus doesn't sound like Archippus, but that's what happens to me. Okay, so now, Paul said that here he has turned Alexander over, Satan, over to Satan that he may learn not to blaspheme. If you were to study 1 Corinthians and you were to look at why a person would be turned over to Satan, it would be because of blasphemy or because of gross sin in their lives. 
And I want to ask you the question, how did Alexander come from being the face willing to step forward and address with reason Paul's accusation against the idols? Now, we're not, we don't see Alexander speaking, but we see him being willing to speak on behalf of the disciples, on behalf of Paul. And here we see him being turned over by Paul to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. I'll tell you how. It's because he blasphemed. He blasphemed. I suspect, reading into it, again, I'm reading into it, but I suspect that his blasphemy had something to do with making little critters and calling them God. Probably out of copper making copper gods. And I suspect that the motivation behind it was that there was good money in it. And we see in this same text a context of one blasphemer who murdered Christians and found God's long-suffering and mercy through faith. And we find another individual that appears to have been a believer and willing to stand for the faith, who has become a blasphemer. And for me, there's just a practical warning. None of us are above anything. None of us are above anything. When Paul was railing against the church, uh, breathing threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, the believers thought he'd never be capable of being a believer. And yet, as an evidence of the long-suffering and merciful character of Jesus Christ, Jesus not only saved Paul, but put him in the ministry as an apostle. Anybody can do anything. Anybody can be anything. A blasphemer can become, not today, but can become a believer and be put into the ministry. He can't be made an apostle, but he can become a believer and be made useful for the ministry. On the other hand, somebody who's not a blasphemer, who is useful for the ministry, could be made a blasphemer. And I've seen both. One of the warnings that frightens me the worst in the Scripture is the warnings about false teachers coupled with the some of you. Inclusion. For instance, in Acts, when Paul goes to the pastors, the elders around Ephesus, and he says, Take heed to the flock of God, for there, you know, there's ravenous wolves that are crept in. And then he is talking about, you know, the wolves are going to come from you guys. You're going to be the false teachers. Watch out for false teachers. Watch out that you don't become a false teacher. How's one become a false teacher? The actual act is probably different in almost every scenario, but I think the motivation is almost always pride or covetousness, greed. Wanting people to follow you to the point that you're not concerned about whether or not you blaspheme Jesus Christ so that you can have your following. It's pretty easy for it to happen that way. Being unwilling to recognize that you've spoken in error and simply say, I was wrong. The Word of God says thus and so, and because the Word of God is my authority, then that's what I believe, not what I said. I was wrong about what I said. And then the willingness to be out of fellowship with God. It's all based on pride and covetousness. And unfortunately, our fellow Alexander, we don't really know him well, we know that uh, he did Paul a great evil in 2 Timothy. There's a reference that indicates that. But as I do character studies and I look at some of these obscure individuals in the book of Acts, I ask a couple questions. Why is this here? Why is Alexander mentioned? And then again mentioned and again mentioned. And I think that the practical application or, or a, pract a practical application for us this evening is simply to warn us about the dangers of unbelief and blasphemy and to encourage us that a blasphemer can be redeemed
and a person who's not a blasphemer can go the wrong direction. We ought to have great fear. Now, I'm not talking about losing your salvation tonight, and Paul isn't either. When he talks about deliverer or destruction, or Satan for the destruction of the flesh, the assumption is that he actually is a believer, but that he's got the protection, the umbrella of God's protection removed from him so that Satan can have at him with his blasphemy. He can have the results of it. I would never want that, would you? Well, let's be careful to heed God's Word. Father, thank You for what we've learned this evening. I pray that You would just help us to retain and to be able to meditate on some of the truths that we've seen tonight. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.